Today we continue forward with this letter from Peter to these believers who are the elect exiles, uh, those who are, who are displaced, those who are in a, a location, in, in cities where, where it is not safe for them. And what we've been seeing, just to kind of look back so we can kind of get our bearings a bit, is Peter is, is giving instructions to these elect exiles that, that started off with, with this as his argument. We are born again to a living hope. We're born again to a living hope that we're called to be holy because we worship and are saved by the Holy One. And because we're saved by him, because we are holy and a set-aside people who are being built up as a spiritual house of the church, it is our role, it is our duty, it is our design, our purpose that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light. And to do that, Peter argued that, that we must keep our conduct among the Gentiles and the unbelievers honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, based on what you believe, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And over the past few weeks, he went on to show that, that some of the way that we're going to live this out, some of the behaviors that we're going to have as we're seeking to live this honorable life is the way that we submit. And so we talked through this reality of be subject to every human institution. We're to submit to our governing authorities. He talked through how slaves are to submit to their masters. Wives are to submit to their even unbelieving, difficult husbands. And husbands submit themselves to God and to the needs of their wife as they desire to love and lead her according to knowledge of God and of her with a desire that their prayers may not be hindered if they refuse to do so. And now today, we get into what is really kind of the closing argument of this section that started in chapter 2, verse 11. Let's read together, starting at verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He starts off this section with, with this word, finally. He, he's, he's kind of going to wrap up with a couple more examples for us, kind of exactly what we're supposed to do. As he started this idea of submission, of, of living in this honorable way, he started broad. There was nobody in this congregation who he was speaking to that was not needing to submit themselves to a governing authority. And then he begins to narrow it to some specific groups as examples. He, he talks to slaves. He, he talks to wives. He, he talks to husbands. And now he's going to broaden it out again just in case you're not a slave. Just, just in case you're not a wife or a husband. He is still speaking to all of us, the church. And what he's going to do now is he's going to give us two more ways that we're going to live in an honorable way so that those who are outside of the church, not believers, might look in, see our good deeds, see the way that we live in the face of hardship, in the face of suffering, in the face of persecution, and come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The first way that... He's going to lay this out for us is verse 8, the way in which we believers interact with one another. That's tricky. Uh, the, the church is a messy place. If you've been a believer for long or if you've been in many churches, uh, here is the reality. There is no perfect church. It's Charles Spurgeon who said that you might go around looking everywhere to find for yourself a perfect church, but should you find one, you should not attend it because once you do, it will no longer be perfect. (laughs) 
The church is a a tricky place. And and we have then this exhortation for, for how we as believers are supposed to interact with one another. That the way that we interact should in fact be shocking to those who look in from the outside. There was a Roman general uh, during the time of the church kind of building itself up after Christ had ascended back into heaven. And he was speaking of the Christians as they were trying to kind of stamp out this movement of rogue people that they thought were insane. And he said, it is impossible. It's impossible because all they do is love each other. And so if we take something from one of them, everybody else gives them that thing instead. What they're doing is incredible, and they just keep multiplying, and we cannot stop it because of the behavior in which they interacted together. So Peter here is is laying out for us what some of that might look like, and we're going to just kind of break them down one by one. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind. It's this idea of being harmonious. It doesn't mean that you agree on everything or that that you're all the same in any capacity. It's not referring to to uniformity, that you must dress the same or act the same or, or talk the same. In fact, that would go against what God actually desires for his church. Instead, it speaks of of getting along with people with whom you actually do disagree about a lot of different things. It means that that our agreements, the things that we actually agree on and hold tightly to, are so significant that the things that we disagree on become irrelevant to us. This is the idea of you need to decide what hills you're actually willing to die on. And, And if those hills are not, in fact, hills about truth, hills about the gospel, about who God is and what he's done for us, you need not hold on to them so tightly or you will divide over foolishness. Whether it is true or not, there's at least urban legends of of churches that have divided over the color of the carpet. Churches that have divided whether they were going to have screens on the wall or, or sing out of a hymnal. There's even Rumored to have been churches that have divided over the question, did Adam and Eve have a belly button? We hold on to foolish things far too tightly. And we forget that the thing that we agree on is the thing that's actually eternal. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Redemption through his blood and eternal life with him forever. And within the church... Not every person is going to agree with every policy. Not every person is going to agree with with procedures or even the decisions where the leadership is going. But that does not mean that our disagreement has to result in creating division or controversy. When a person wants to take an issue, particularly one that that is not central to the gospel, And make that their hobby horse. Make that their soapbox in which they're going to rally people to their cry. Scripture talks about that person as being somebody who is divisive. They are doing damage to the body. They don't do the work of an evangelist. They do the work of a terrorist. And that is not what we're called to. We are called to follow a king who laid down his life in preference. With unity of mind together. Next, with sympathy. We ought to be sensitive to the others in our body, to their joys and to their difficulties. We should be known for the way that we celebrate with people who are experiencing joy, and we should be known for the way that we care about people who are experiencing sorrow and trouble. We weep with those who weep, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. This can be hard. Sympathy can be tricky because at times we struggle celebrating somebody else's success. Maybe it looks like this. I want what they have. They're experiencing joy, but they have the joy that I desire. They have the gifts that I desire. They have the child that I desire. We see their joy and sometimes it can remind us of our loss. We see their joy, and we want to feel sorry for ourselves instead of feeling joy with them. 
And at times we struggle caring for others in their hurts because I just don't know what to say. Like I I look at the situation and it's just messy and I, I don't know how to step in to weep with those who weep. Or maybe I've never been through that before. And so, so I don't even know what they're experiencing. So how could I ever step into the mess? Can I just tell you that there's a lot of ministry that's done just being present. It doesn't have to be words. It doesn't have to be you spouting wisdom or, or even being able to, to turn to the right passage in Scripture. But sometimes sympathy from a biblical perspective is being there. And being willing to weep with those who weep. This quote from Rob Green is helpful. He said, church, we can work on this. We can say, when I experience joy, I will try to be sensitive to those who would like my joy. When I hear of someone else's joy, I will be sensitive to them by not raining on their party. When I experience hardship, I will not demand that those who are happy should feel all of my same emotional pain. And when I hear of someone's hardship, I will be sensitive to the hurts that they are suffering. This is actually something that you can learn and grow in. If you're like, well, that's not my gift. I just, I'm not an emotional person. I don't care, and neither does this text. Peter's not saying, well, if your personality allows it, you should do this. No, if you're in the church, if you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, this is what you should do. Live in sympathy with one another. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Next, we see brotherly love. It's an interesting couple of words that, that, that get thrown out a lot, and then... The question is, how do we actually live it out? Brotherly love is is certainly more than, but but is not less than this. And I'm reading this specifically because I think it's important. Brotherly love is having the other person's best interest in mind. It includes protection, care, and provision. Brotherly love is having the other person's best interest in mind, and it includes protection, care, provision. The word that Peter is using here is specifically one that is about family. He's speaking to the church, but he's talking about family. In in Greco-Roman society, that, that idea is actually kind of shocking because the family unit was actually core and central to what they believed, at least for a while. And so for him to be saying, love those who are around you as a brother, It says something specific about what that love should look like. Because the reality is this. With family, at least most of us, are willing to endure much more than we're willing to endure with somebody who's not related to us. With family, I'm often willing to hear a lot harder things from them and still enjoy being in their company. See, family is something that that most of us hold in the highest regard but it's messy and it can be difficult when you have that, that brother or that sister or that parent or that child who, who isn't walking the way that you would desire or want to see them walk. It's difficult. Family is somebody that you're around so much that you do see them, in fact, at their best often, but you also see them at their worst. That's a hard time to love someone. But we're called to love them as family Brotherly love is a love that brings with it sympathy, it brings comfort, it brings encouragement, but it also brings rebuke and correction because it has the person's highest good in mind. Brotherly love does not shy away from confronting sin. In fact, the most unloving thing that we could do as the church as believers, is to look at another believer who's living in unrepentant sin and decide that for our comfort, it would be better for us to say nothing. That's a dangerous statement. We should care deeply about the eternal soul of another person. And when we see sin, we are called to address it. 
That is part of brotherly love. And when we correct someone, we do so for their good, not for our agenda. We do so because it represents protecting them and caring for them and providing for them at their greatest, most central need, which is growing to look more like Jesus. Next, we have tenderheartedness, or this could be translated compassion in a lot of your translations. Uh, Literally, in the Greek, this would be translated more like good bowels, which is a weird thing because we talk about hearts and not guts. But but this is talking about that, that central core of who you are, that you have a feeling for these people that is not ethereal, that is not even emotionally based, but it is at the core of who you are. You actually feel for them. And it's not a feeling that, that's fluttery or that moves by, but it's a feeling that, that demands action from you. It's closely tied to sympathy, but it doesn't stop at feeling. It, it leads to response. Our feelings and emotions of compassion concerning a person or, or event should, should move us to actually intervene They should drive us to help people. We see often that, that Christ himself was moved with compassion that he saw people who were hurting, that he saw people who were struggling, and he was moved by a compassion that was in him to do good for them and to love them. We live in a world of suffering. And here's what makes compassion sometimes hard. Sometimes you have to be compassionate for a person who's hurting you. And I think often it helps for us to remember that the person who is hurting us in the moment is often being hurt elsewhere. There's a phrase that we use sometimes that, that hurting people hurt people. And having compassion for them causes us to stop and to remember that I am not this person's biggest problem. I'm not. But I can point them to their greatest hope. We have to fight the urge when we see somebody who's enduring hardship to think, good, they're getting what they deserve. Or maybe that'll teach them what it feels like to be on the other side of that kind of conflict or that kind of pain. No. No, we should desire their deepest good. We should desire blessing for them, which we're going to get to in a moment. Lastly, we have a humble mind. Uh, Stuart Scott wrote a book uh, years ago. It's like 30 pages long or something like that called From Pride to Humility. It'd be very worth your picking up and reading. And that he says, uh, there's a few uh, identifying markers for a humble person. He says, the humble person has no right to question or to judge God because they understand who God is and who they are. That the humble person is overwhelmed with God's undeserved grace. That the humble person sees himself as no better than others. And I think this ties into compassion before it. That if we remember this, I have more in common with this person who is hurting or struggling or maybe hurting me. I have more in common with them than I do with Jesus. The humble person properly understands their gifts and abilities as well as who it is that gave them those gifts and abilities. And a humble person expresses thankfulness for criticism and correction instead of lashing back or jumping to defensiveness. A humble person can actually believe that if a person brings something to them, it is not for their harm, but in fact might be for their good. Anyone else feeling a bit lacking as we go through this list? Because like I'm looking at this, this list of, of the ways that we, as the church, are supposed to interact with each other. I, I see that there are just so many ways where I tend to fail. Which, as we get a little bit further into this text, becomes a little troubling. When you see the result of doing these things. But for now, we move on to verse 9. 
First, we had the way that we interact with each other. That is a sign to the unbelieving world. Next, we have the way that we interact with those people who are, in fact, persecuting us, to those people who might be attacking us, to those people who wish ill for us. It says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. In some ways, this seems very simple. Do not repay evil for evil. All right, so, so what does that practically look like? I think we look to Christ. Christ who said if someone hits you, if they strike you, you do not strike back, but instead turn the other cheek. That if somebody comes and they, they steal your cloak, let them take your tunic also. This is not living in a way where it's an eye for an eye or where we're looking for our own form of vengeance or justice. We're called to return blessing for evil. That's hard. That's hard because I want what's fair. I like to think that I want what is due to me and I want them to get what is due to them. That is a dangerous, dangerous game to play. Because what I deserve is wrath. I don't deserve blessing. I've done nothing to earn blessing. I deserve wrath. I deserve judgment. And yet so often my heart's desire is to seek justice for myself. Next it says, do not repay reviling for reviling. This is, this is harsh, harsh verbal criticism, condemnation, and being cut down to your core with words. What's our natural response when we hear something like that? When somebody says something negative to us, my immediate response is to want to launch something back right away. I don't even care necessarily what they said to me, but if they said it even in the wrong tone, like, I'm ready to go now. And what Peter's saying is, nope, <laughs> like, as that thought is in your mind, as those words want to come out of your mouth, you stop yourself. You do not allow yourself to return reviling for reviling. How do we do that? How do we actually tame the tongue? We tame the tongue with prayer and practice. And we tame the tongue by looking to one who has set an example for us perfectly. See, this phrase that he uses here, do not repay, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called. If you turn your Bibles back just one page to chapter 2, you'll see some very similar words. Chapter 2, verse 21 starts off, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Are we getting what Jesus is actually doing here? What Peter's saying to us that Christ has done? Not only did he not return evil for evil, not only did he not revile those who reviled him, but he entrusted himself to someone else's care. He entrusted himself to the one who will ultimately deliver judgment. He blessed those who did not bless him. And in case you're confused, that, that's you. That, that's me. Christ blesses those who do not bless him and those who do not deserve his blessing. This idea of bless, to bless someone else, this, this is active, this is not passive. And so I think what we might tend to do as believers is a lot of times we, we hear this idea of don't attack back. Don't launch an insult back at that person. Don't, don't try to seek vengeance or justice for yourself. And so what we do instead is we say, well, okay, fine, I'll just do nothing. I will just cold shoulder this person. 
I'll just have nothing to do with them. I'll just never enter into the fray. But that's actually still not what we're called to do. It's active. It is not passive. This means that when someone does harm to you, you actively seek good for them. When someone does harm for you, you actively seek good for them. This word bless actually uh, is the word eulogia in Greek. This is where we get our word eulogy. It literally to speak well of someone in their passing. I'm sure it's happened. I have never read a eulogy where somebody just rips somebody to shreds. I've just, I've never seen it. It's probably there. Like, you'll probably email it to me later. That's fine. I'm sure there's a lot of examples on the internet, but, but I've never seen it. What I see is that in a eulogy, what is typical is people try to present the best about that person's life that they can in three paragraphs or less. For to this you have been called, bless those who revile you. Bless those who seek to do you harm. Bless those who bring you great shame and dismay. I think as we see something like this, as we see calling, it can be a little bit difficult because we get hung up on calling a lot. It's really common in the church for people to start asking questions like, what is God's will for me? What is God's will for my family? What is the purpose of my life? What am I supposed to be doing? And here, Peter's actually giving us one that is just clear cut. This is purpose for you, that you might grow to look like Christ in the way that you bless those who do you harm. And that to them may be the very thing that causes them to see the grace of God in your life and come to know it themselves. We are called to Christ's likeness. For to this you have been called. As Christ did these things, so we too should do these things. And then we need to remember that he has already perfectly done it for us. See, the living hope to which we've been called, the blessing that we have been given is this. You were never able to do it yourself, but somebody else did it for you. Somebody else did it for you. And so we're going to look at a little bit of how this blessing works out. We experience the blessing today, yes, today, through the tangible, real presence of God in our lives and through his driving in us conformity to the image of his son. We experience blessing today through the presence of God in our lives and him through his spirit and work in our hearts, driving us into conformity with his son to look more like Christ. And what we often don't like is he will use the difficulties and sufferings and difficult people in our lives to foster that very thing. Are you in a troubling circumstance? How is God using that to drive you to look more like Christ? Is your job not what you would desire for it to be today? How is God using that to make you look more like Christ? Is somebody attacking you where you do not deserve it and have done them no harm? How is God using that to drive you to look more like Christ? For to this you have been called. Moving on, then Peter gives the longest quote that we have of, of the Old Testament from him in, in this book so far, from Psalm 34. He says, for, so that, that's his kind of like, here's, here's what you're supposed to do. Love each other like this. Bless the world who seeks to hurt you like this for this reason. And now he's pointing us back to what is his theological grounding for making these statements. For whoever desires to love life and see good days... Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the second time that we've seen in 1 Peter that he is quoting from Psalm 34 directly. A lot of people actually argue that the entire basis for Peter's argument through this whole letter is grounded and rooted in Psalm 34. And he starts off with this idea, so whoever desires to love life and see good days, read that as whoever desires good, whoever desires to obtain this blessing that we've talked about, 
Let him do these things. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. It's interesting how much of this is based in our words and our speech. Let him keep his tongue from evil. Let him keep his tongue from slander, from lashing back, from trying to defend himself. Let him keep his tongue from attacking those who might do him harm. Let him keep his lips from speaking deceit. If a person is living in deception, if a person is lying to other people, their only motivation is ever their own good. And we can say, well, I'm trying to spare their feelings. No, no, no. You're trying to spare yourself a difficult conversation. Deception always has at its core, I want myself to look better. Always. Well, what if I'm talking bad about somebody else? You shouldn't do that. And also, you're trying to make yourself look better than them. Deception is a wicked, wicked thing. And he continues on. Let him keep his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Again, this is active. This is not just sitting there allowing something to happen. This is actual, real, active repentance in process. This is confess, repent, replace. True repentance is turning away from the thing that is evil and turning instead to the thing that is right. And next, this one, this one's hard. Let him seek peace and pursue it. It's not enough to just sit back and not take part in what you see as the problem. It is not enough to passively sit by and allow things to happen around you. It is not enough for you when you have been sinned against by someone to leave it to them to come and make it right. Even within the church, Scripture says in Matthew 18, has your brothers sinned against you? If they have, go to them. Pursue peace. Pursue it. I think a lot of times we like to think of ourselves as peaceful people or we're not a part of the problem or we'll call ourselves peacemakers, but we're just peace fakers. We're not actually doing anything. We are to pursue peace even with those who do us harm. For, and this word for is actually not in the original text. So this is Peter using another word. This, this for is him saying, because of this, this. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so Peter is saying, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. Let him not be deceitful. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it because... The eyes of the Lord are on a person who will live in this way. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. As believers, we need to understand that the eyes of the Lord being on the righteous and his ears actually hearing our prayer is one of the most significant blessings that we possess. To, to think through the audacity that we as created beings, sinners, completely undeserving of grace, breath, or life, are able to go directly to our Heavenly Father and Creator, who is infinitely greater, bigger, more significant, and holy than we can ever possibly imagine. And He says, Come to me and dine. Come speak with me because I desire to speak to you. He hears our prayers and he answers them. As we're going to look at that in just a moment here in Psalm 34. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is back to what we saw in verse 7 last week. For husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Live with your wives according to knowledge, honoring her as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered so that your prayers may not be hindered. As Alex mentioned last week, this is the face of the Lord being set against someone. It's what we see in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then we might be sitting here with some questions. Well, how in the world am I supposed to do this? How in the world am I even supposed to deal with the people in the church, like the people I'm supposed to like? How am I supposed to deal with them in this loving way, let alone those people in the world who seek to do me harm? Those people in the world that would be opposed to Christ, who he is, and what he's done in my life. Well, I don't think it's an accident that that Peter uses Psalm 34. See, this psalm was written after, after David, King David later on, but David meets with a king named Abimelech. You see Abimelech a lot in Scripture. It's basically a placeholder name for a king of a region. But David is hiding out among the Philistines in a place called Gath. If you're like, where's Gath? You might remember a, a pretty significant person who came from there named Goliath. Goliath of Gath. And so David is hiding out in the hometown of the giant who he killed for King Saul among the Philistines. And he has this meeting with the king where he ends up being spared and is able to leave. And it is after he has this meeting, you should go read the story yourself. There's a lot of details there. He writes Psalm 34. He's running for his life. He's running from Saul. Saul is daily pursuing after David and trying to see him killed. So much so that David goes and hides in the place that he thinks Saul would be least likely to look for him in Gath. And then he writes this psalm. It's after this meeting that that David has not one, but, but two encounters with King Saul where Saul is we'll say quite compromised and and very, very vulnerable, where David had the opportunity to kill Saul himself, and two times David opted not to. The man who was pursuing him to kill him, David opted to bless instead. Why? Because he chose to act with honor and righteousness and to bless rather than choosing to seek justice or vengeance for himself. He trusted that God is the one who will deliver perfect justice. And he writes words like this in in this psalm. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. But to the quote that Peter uses, it starts off this way in verse 11. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their trouble. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Why Psalm 34? Because Peter is giving us an example of a person who is facing significant oppression and harm. Who is choosing to walk in righteousness because he knows that there is a holy judge who knows him and cares for him. Who's choosing to walk in righteousness because he knows that his justice is imperfect, but God's justice is perfect. And what more, he points us to Psalm 34 because Psalm 34 is ultimately not even about David because it's about Jesus. See, Peter has already pointed us once, for to this you have been called to the example of Christ, 
who did not revile in return, who did not return evil for evil, who, who willingly surrendered himself to the holy hand of God, knowing that it is God who is going to justify, that it is God who brings justice, that it is God who brings perfect vengeance always, and that our call is to bless those who condemn us. And now he points us back to Psalm 34, where David is going to reiterate the exact same thing. And then we think about Peter himself, a man who has experienced significant suffering, a man who ultimately would be killed by crucifixion like Christ was. We need to remember that the people that Peter is writing to are Christians who are experiencing significant suffering and persecution based on their faith in Christ. And it's important that as we look at this psalm, as we look at what Peter's saying here, that we have a couple of things that we keep in mind. And uh, basically, we have one point, two questions, and we're going to be done. The first point is this. There is fruit behavior that is directly connected to those that God has his eye on their righteousness. There is fruit behavior, and you cannot separate it. But it is incredibly important that we remember that in Peter's argument throughout 1 Peter, he has said over and over and over again from chapter 1 through now that that is not righteousness that is purchased by your works. You have been born again to a living hope. You have obtained an inheritance that was not yours. That we wait for Christ to see the perfect picture of grace in its whole. We need to understand that Peter is not teaching any form of works-based righteousness. That Peter is not preaching any form of you will be blessed in eternity because of your labors here today. Rather, Peter is making a statement about the way that we behave that looks like this. If you are redeemed... If you are one of the elect exiles, if you have been purchased by the blood of Christ, if you have been born again to a living hope, this will be in your life. It will. James himself later says that faith without works is dead. Jesus says that a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree does not bear good fruit. If you are redeemed, there will be fruit of it, and you will be growing to look more like Christ. And if not, then you need to repent. You need to confess your sins, repent of them, turn to the greater salvation and Savior, and replace them with worship. How is it that I become righteous? It is not through effort. It has never been through effort. The answer is here again in Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord, verse 15, are towards the righteous. The way that we become righteous, the way that we have the eyes of the Lord upon us, is specifically because of this. God did not give his son his ear. God turned his face from his son on the cross so that God would not have to do that to you and to me. We obtain this righteousness not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Verses 19 and 20 say that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. God did not deliver Christ from seeing afflictions so that he could deliver us from seeing those afflictions. He keeps all his bones. Not one is broken. Part of this promise that's so beautiful for us is that 
that God then eventually does, in fact, turn his face towards his son, sees him walk out of the grave with confidence, having defeated sin and death forever for everyone who is in him. Our blessing those who revile us does not earn our salvation. Peter's already made it clear. But Christ's work on the cross earns our salvation perfectly. The second question is this, how do I know that God will be near to me in the midst of my trials and sufferings? How do I know that he would be there? Because oftentimes I feel like I'm alone. First, God promises us repeatedly in his word that he will be here. And we see it here again in Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The blessing that we receive both gives us the presence of God and conforms us to the image of Christ today, but it also gives us hope of promise for the future. Like we see in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, so we do not lose heart. Though your outer self is wasting away, your inner self is being renewed day by day. For this brief momentary affliction is building up for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, not in the things that you can see, but in the things that are unseen. Not in the temporary, but in the eternal. And we know that God will be with us because God keeps his promises. Verse 20 says, he keeps all his bones and not one of them is broken. It points directly to Christ. God said it and he meant it and it was true. And the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Church, we're called to live in a very particular way through this, but we need to understand that it is by grace alone that we can do it. We are called to live this way, and we need to remember that it is not by my strength, but by the strength of a risen Savior that I'm able to do it. And we press forward, trusting that God is going to sanctify us and that he has given us the church and he has given us, even those who oppose us, to help us in this process to look more like his son. Let's pray together. Father God, you are the one who has given us all we need. God, let us be a church and a people who, who see your goodness and believe that it is actually you who changes us. God, let us be a people who find our hope not in our efforts, but find our hope in your Son. And that God, because of that, that we would be growing daily in the way that we interact with each other, in the way that we love one another. And God, in the way that we interact with the world around us, God, give us the spiritual fortitude to be a people that, that when others look and they see that there is, in fact, something unique and different going on in the lives of these people who will experience suffering, that there is something unique about their response to that, that there is something unique about their response to their attackers. God, that your kingdom might be proclaimed, yes, through our words and also through the ways that we live faithfully according to your word. We pray these things in your holy and your precious name. Amen.